right, you guys, thank you for coming to the Canals Brown Bag. Uh, I'm excited to introduce Bianca Prohaska, who is a Canals Fellow working with International Activities. Bianca earned a Bachelor's in Science in Biology and Marine Biology from Florida Institute of Technology, a Master's of Science in Marine Science from the University of New England, and a Doctorate of Philosophy in Ecology and Evolution from Florida State University. Her main research interests lie in studying the physio physiological ecology of elasmobranchs, which is sharks, skates, and rays, so that the results can be applied to management and conservation. Today, she will be presenting physiological stress in small tooth sawfish, effects of ontogeny, capture method, and habitat quality. Thank you. Um, so thank you all for coming today. I'm just going to be presenting some of my dissertation research on small tooth sawfish. <coughs> And uh, I also want to note that I did this work in cooperation with um, some NOAA researchers as well as some FWC researchers, particularly at uh, NOAA Panama City Lab and Water, Fish, and Wildlife in Port Charlotte. And if you are interested in this research at the end, you're welcome to check out our publication online or I can email you a PDF of it. Um, but the people in red here are the, uh, the NOAA um, researchers from the Panama City Lab. So I like to start out just with a really general overview of my research topic um, during my dissertation work. And basically, why do we care about physiology? So we know that physiology can dictate the life history, behavior, and fitness of an organism. So it's a really important topic um, in that context. And looking at stress within physiology, the basic <laughs> definition is that it's the disruption of homeostasis of an organism by intrinsic or extrinsic stimuli that can elicitate, elicit a compensatory response. And we can use this information from different species to help formulate conservation and management strategies. And so my basic overlying question for all of my dissertation work was just looking at how ecological and anthropogenic forces may affect stress in elasmobranchs. And I also studied this in um, a lot of other different species of sharks, uh, deep, deep water sharks and a couple of species of hammerheads. So a little bit more on sawfishes, because that's what I'll be talking about today. They're a small family of batoids, so they're a species of ray. They're not a shark, even though they seem to have more of a body shape of a shark. And there's five living species. They occur in coastal, subtropical, and tropical waters. And they're among the largest batoids, so they can get up to about five meters long, which is about 17 feet. And they have a really slow life history. Um, which might be a little bit technical or jargony, but that just means that they mature late in life and they have low fecundity, which are attributes that can make them pretty vulnerable to um, fishing pressures. So a little bit more background in terms of their distribution um, in the past. This is their distribution in the Atlantic Basin, the orange here, um, their historic distribution. In the U.S., they were found from Texas to New York historically, but their core was always in southwest Florida, and now they're really only found in southwest Florida. I'll be using this term a lot, young of the year or YOY, and these are just our zero to one-year-olds and also small juveniles, and they are born at 70 centimeters, which is about this big, so pretty big when they're born. They inhabit shallow estuaries and coastal bays until they're about three years old, reaching about 220 centimeters. And then the adults and large juveniles are 100 centimeters or five meters in length. And adults and large juveniles will also inhabit shallow coastal estuaries, but they also go offshore into about 100 meters depth of water on the continental shelf. So in terms of nurseries in the United States, there's two known nursery habitats. The first is the Charlotte Harbor Estuary Unit, um, located here by the circle, and that's the Peace and Caloosahatchee Rivers in southwest Florida. And this is unfortunately a pretty anthropogenically influenced area as a nursery habitat. There's a lot of coastal development and not too much natural coastline left. There's also the 10,000 Islands National Wildlife Refuge and Everglades National Park unit located here, and it is still relatively pristine with a lot of natural habitat. As far as their status, 
Uh, over the 20th century, there's believed to be about a 95% population decline in small tooth sawfish in the US. And this is from a peer reviewed paper, a quote, that sawfishes are arguably one of the most threatened marine fishes in the world. And so why is that? So some sources of their population decline in the US are thought to be some targeted commercial fishing while limited. And this picture is from the Florida Keys in the 1940s. And they were captured not just um, for their flesh, but mostly for their rostra. Um, so here is a picture of a bunch of dried rostra. They were sold um, pretty heavily as just curio items, something somebody would slap up on their wall, an interesting talking point. Unfortunately, they're still of interest today. Um, these are mostly plastic ones, um, but this is at a hotel, um, and these are plastic replica of sawfish rostra sold at Bloomingdale's. Um, so still of interest, unfortunately, today for people to look at, I guess. Um, another source of population decline is sport fishing. So they were um, a fun fish to go out and catch and get a cool picture with your buddy afterwards. And there's also directed harvest common outside of the US, which is still ongoing, um, not just for consumption, but for ceremonial objects. And then um, in some of the rooster fighting in South America, they will take the teeth off the sawfish rostra and attach them to the rooster's feet for better fighting. Another source of population decline is bycatch mortality, which is pretty common. They're caught in gill nets, trawls, and on long lines. If you think about this giant hedge clipper they have, it can get entangled really easily. And then one that people don't think about as often is uh, habitat loss. So this is kind of a silent uh, threat in terms of population decline. But like I mentioned, sawfish spend a lot of time in shallow coastal estuaries. They really um, utilize uh, mangrove habitats for protection during those early years. So unfortunately, in Florida, people like to build their houses in those types of habitats. Um, so a lot of mangroves have been taken out, um, which is probably one of the sources of population decline. Luckily, in 2003, small tooth sawfish were listed on the Endangered Species Act. And so their current status today, they're listed on IUCN as critically endangered. They're still listed on the US Endangered Species Act, making it illegal to catch, harm, harass, or kill. And they're also listed on CITES Appendix 1 as endangered, which bans international trade. So their current threats are still existing in the US. Um, particularly rod and reel fishermen, they still routinely capture sawfish while not targeted. It still happens and they can be on the line for up to one to three hours before the fishermen even know what they have. And they have a pretty good <laughs> idea what they have, but before they see it and land it at the boat. They're caught in bottom longline fisheries still in Florida Keys. Mm -hmm. They're caught in shrimp trawls and this is probably uh, the most direct source of mortality because when they're brought up in a shrimp trawl, they almost always come up dead or dying. They can become entangled in marine debris very easily, like I mentioned. Federal gillnet fishery, they still have been found to be caught in um, that fishery as well. Unfortunately, some people, when they catch them, they purposely injure or kill them as well. And habitat loss is still an ongoing problem because people are still building their houses on the coast. So getting back to stress physiology. So when I'm talking about it today, I'm mostly talking about anthropogenic stress. So these are stressors that surpass natural stress. So here's a picture of a crocodile eating a sawfish in Australia. That would be a natural stressor. But this group of guys over here that felt the need to take the sawfish out of the water to get a picture with it would be surpassing natural stress. This is anthropogenic. And it can have direct life history, behavior, and fitness effects even if it's not a direct source of mortality. Unfortunately, in the Lazarbrank, so shark skates and rays, we're not able to directly assess the primary stress response to so looking at hormones like we can look at in other species of fish or mammals and birds. But we look at the secondary stress response, things like blood gases and acid-base status. And these can be indicators of immediate and delayed post-release mortality. And they have been used pretty frequently. So some of those stress parameters, I'll just go over them very quickly so you have a little bit of an idea of what I'm talking about in my results. 
we look at glucose pretty frequently. So this is your fight or flight response. And if we see increase, increases in glucose in the blood, that's usually indicative of a hormone response that's telling the liver to release a bunch of glucose into the blood so that you have this extra energy to fight or flee. We can see increases in PCO2, and that's related to respiratory stress. So any sort of respiratory inhibition over the gills or say a ram ventilating shark that needs to swim to breathe, isn't able to swim, we'll see increases in PCO2. We can see increases in lactate and decreases in bicarbonate. That's related to metabolic stress. Um, so the more the animal's moving, whether it's trying to find safe refuge or it's on the line and it's struggling to get away, you get a buildup of lactate in the muscle and it leaches into the blood. You can also think about this if you go for a long run, you get a muscle cramp afterwards. It's sort of the same concept, it's just a buildup of lactate. And we have naturally occurring bicarbonate in our blood that will decrease while it's trying to buffer the acidic response of lactate. We can see an overall depression in pH because both PCO2 and lactate are acidic. And we also look at hematocrit and potassium, which are directly linked to lactate. So the more lactate you have in your muscle, the more fluid will shift from your blood into the muscle to dilute it there. And we'll see an increase in hematocrit, which just is the percent of red blood cells. So if we took the whole blood and spun it down, um, there would appear to be more red blood cells. And then potassium can also leak out of the muscle tissue and into the blood. And this can have effects on heart functioning and also just neuromuscular issues in general. But today I'll just focus on respiratory stress and metabolic stress in my results. And I'll keep it pretty brief for time. So our overall rationale for this study was we really just wanted to understand the response to anthropogenic um, influences in the small tooth sawfish so that we could hopefully better inform species specific management um, and help the recovery team um, with the rebound of the small tooth sawfish population in the US. So my major questions were, does the stress response change over ontogeny? So ontogeny, the basic definition is just different life stages. So the young of the year to the juveniles to the adults. Does capture method affect the stress response? So I'll go over the different capture methods we used right after this. And do anthropogenic influences on those young of the year and juvenile habitats affect their stress physiology? So the first um, type of capture method I'm going to talk about is long line. And we use this to capture adults and large juveniles. And we would trailer our boat down from Florida State and to the Keys. And we'd do day trips for about a week where we set these scientific long lines baited with ladyfish, um, trying to mimic what we'd see in the bottom long line fishery. And I have a short video to play um, describing that. So here um, is my advisor setting out our longline gear. We had about nine foot long gangens um, that are attached to a main line and they're all late baited with half pieces of ladyfish like they do in the commercial industry. And then our lines are set for an hour. And at that time, we then haul back in the line and sample anything as quickly as possible. Thank you. Ooh, it's okay. <laughs> so then if we did catch a sawfish, we would restrain it as quickly as possible. The first thing we do is we get a rope around its rostra, that's the business end, the end you don't want to get hit with. And then <laughs> we get a rope around its caudal fin and basically string it up alongside the boat, the animals in the water the whole time, and we sample it as quickly as possible and get it on its way. And just before there are any questions about it, we've had no mortalities. We acoustically tag and satellite tag um, almost all of our, set, our sawfish and we've had no more mortalities. Um, just another picture of us sampling the sawfish. And then we sampled large juveniles and adults in two separate regions in this shallow area, which is Florida Bay. It's two to five meters deep. It's pretty shallow. And then also off the coast, um, the continental shelf in 40 to 80 meters of water. So then the next capture method we used was gill net. And this was primarily to catch young of the year and small juveniles. And we did this um, with 
NOAA Panama City down in the Everglades and also with FWC in Port Charlotte. And it's kind of hard to see because they blend in really well, but there's a little sawfish there and there. And we set our line perpendicular to shore and it's pretty easy to tell as soon as you caught anything. We're right next to the, the gill net the whole time. If we see anything in the net, we jump in the water and go investigate it. If it's a sawfish, we start disentangling it right away and getting blood and sampling it. So that's the first thing we do is we collect a blood sample as soon as possible. Um, and this is getting blood from a couple of the little ones. And it's a little bit different getting blood from the big guys, a little bit harder. <laughs> and then I uh, have another video. So this is actually us in Andros, Bahamas. So a different survey, but still a small two sawfish. You can see the first thing that we're doing is when we pull in a sawfish is we're trying to get that rostral rope. Um, and this guy was actually pretty calm. Sometimes they can be thrashing around like crazy, like, like that. Um, <laughs> and then the next thing we get the line around the caudal fin. And like I said, we're trying to get blood as quickly as possible. So I just, jump in the water and start to sample it. Um, generally, I don't jump in the water. It was shallow at first, but then by the end of this, you'll see I'm swimming. Our boat started drifting into deeper water. But we get the blood sample. That's priority number one after we know that the animal's restrained and safe. So then once we have the blood, we have a meter on the boat that can tell us lactate, bicarbonate, PCO2, and pH immediately. So we know even before we release the animal what these levels are. And then back at the lab, we can analyze glucose using a glucose meter like some of you may use yourselves. We can analyze hematocrit back at the lab. And then we spin down the remaining blood and we keep the plasma. And we can analyze potassium in the lab um, afterwards. And we also have a lot of saved plasma that we're hoping to use to analyze those hormones I told you about. Um, there's a group working on an assay to validate that. And hopefully when that's finished, we'll be able to actually look at stress hormones with our blood. So just a quick um, review of the samples I've collected. We've sampled 83 sawfish for this paper, 42 young of the year, 13 juveniles, and 28 adults. And as far as capture methods, it's pretty um, spread out. We had 22 shallow long line, 11 deep <clears throat> long line, and 46 gill net. We also had a couple serendipitous captures, three on rod and reel, and one via dip net where we just saw one in the water and stuck a dip net in. And <laughs> we, we sampled it within about 30 seconds. Um, the last two methods are just anecdotal and aren't included in any of my analyses. Um, but I do want to point out here, unfortunately, this isn't a perfect design. We don't have all of our ontogenetic stages sampled in the same way. So it's hard to say exactly um, if it's capture method affecting something or age. Um, but just keep that in mind and know that the results are confounded like that. But we did the best that we could. So looking at ontogeny and capture method, and I'm just going to go through those two parameters that I mentioned so I don't bore you all. <laughs> Um, but first, PCO2, so that's respiratory stress, if you remember. Higher concentrations would be indicative of higher respiratory stress. So looking over ontogeny, um, here is young of the year, juvenile and adult. We saw significant, significantly higher concentrations in our young of the year, um, higher yet, higher concentrations in juveniles than adults. But we're not sure if that's affected by capture method as well. So we looked at gillnet only captured young of the year and juveniles since they were also caught by the same method. And when we did that, we saw no significant difference. There is certainly slightly higher concentrations in young of the year, but it wasn't significant. So it's likely that it's the capture method that's driving these higher concentrations, which isn't super surprising. Gillnet being that the animal is completely restricted and there's potential impediment of ventilation versus a long line where the animal's free to swim. Um, so it's likely capture method increasing these PCO2 concentrations. And then I also included here the rod and reel and dip net just for context, but still pretty anecdotal. Other studies on elastobranchs have found 
um, that there were higher concentrations of PCO2 in rod and rail and gillnet captured elasmobranchs as well. So that's not entirely surprising. It could be the active retrieval during rod and rail capture that's driving that increase in PCO2. In terms of these concentrations compared to other elasmobranchs that have been studied because <laughs> sawfish have not been studied before, um, our concentrations are in range with other sharks that have been studied and other rays that have been studied. Um, average concentrations range from 4 to 14 in TOR. So we're falling in that range, um, and these are also of concentrations with animals that have survived capture. For lactate, if you remember, this is related to metabolic stress. So the more you're moving, the higher concentrations of lactate we would see. For ontogeny, we didn't see any significant differences over those life stages. We did see a lot more variation in young of the year, but it wasn't significantly different. If we look at only gillnet captured young of the year and juveniles, we do see a significant difference, but again, it's probably being driven by the, in a lot of variation in the young of the year stage. Um, so it could be age that's driving this difference. Maybe there's more frequent energetic demands in that young of the year stage they're probably trying to seek refuge more frequently than larger juveniles. And there's some other factors I'll talk about in the next section. And then if we look at capture method, there was no significant difference, just again, a lot more variation in gillnet, but that's probably being driven by those young of the years, um, making up the majority of that class. Uh, rod and reel and dip net were very low for lactate. Uh, like I had mentioned for the dip net, we captured and sampled that animal and. 30 seconds and the lactate response really takes three to six minutes to occur. Um, so it's not surprising that both of those capture methods were pretty low. And just to mention, I think I said this already, but lactate's one of the best indicators of post-release mortality in elasmobranchs. It's been noted in a lot of different scientific studies. And in terms of our concentrations, they're coming out very low compared to other published numbers. They're most close to southern stingrays after capture, which have on average 3.1 millimoles per liter. So this is indicating that they're pretty resilient to capture, at least in terms of lactate. Um, for context, sharks can range anywhere from 4 to 50 millimoles per liter in lactate. And dead or dying blue sharks typically have around 20 millimoles per liter. So our highest concentration was even half of that, which is pretty promising. Results in terms of habitat loss. So if you remember um, the two different nursery habitats I mentioned, um, down here is Florida Bay and lower Everglades, and then this next star is upper Everglades. This is the Caloosahatchee River, and this other star is the Peace River. And these bottom two represent those more pristine habitats, and these upper two represent the two more altered habitats. So in terms of PCO2, we didn't really see any significant changes between the two different habitats, which isn't surprising. It's probably more linked to capture method, and all of these were captured in the same way. For lactate, we saw significantly higher concentrations in the altered habitats, which again could be linked to that habitat loss. So they're probably trying to seek out refuge more frequently, which is causing just an overall chronic increase in lactate in their blood. And noting time, I'm gonna to try to go through this a little quickly. So just general conclusions. Um, gillnet likely is inducing greater stress because of the limitation in mobility and possible impediment of ventilation. Sawfishes seem to have a similar or less pronounced stress response to other elasmobranchs that have been studied. Um, they're more similar to more resilient species. And if you were to look at all of the parameters that I didn't discuss today, we saw similar results in those as well. And there's pro possibly chronic <laughs> metabolic stress occurring in those regions of habitat loss, which is unfortunate. Um, likely from less refuge from human predator interactions. And this can cause behavioral and physiological compensations. And it can get down to population level effects, things like affecting immune systems, reproduction, and growth. So in terms of future directions, I hope to work on this again one day, or I hope that somebody <laughs> does. But people should really investigate the tertiary stress response, which is looking at those population level effects. And we could easily look at um, stress from habitat loss in those two regions that I mentioned and effects on growth. We have the data and we could do that pretty easily. Also looking at rod and rail capture, as this is the most common interaction, most likely in Southwest Florida, comparing fight times if possible, although getting the permit to do that would be very difficult. 
Um, but like I mentioned, they're captured on one to three hour fight times. So if we were able to compare between different fight times, I think that would be very interesting um, as it's a continuous active retrieval the whole time. So the animal's just fighting the whole time. Curious to see what lactate would be like. <laughs> and then as far as shrimp trawl, um, it'd be really interesting to collect some blood from a, a moribund uh, sawfish from a shrimp, shrimp trawl. Because like I mentioned, we've never caught a dead or dying sawfish, which is a good thing. But to have that data would be very useful for post-release mortality studies. And that is the end. I'm sorry, I ran a little late. <laughs> One or two questions. So, so I remember correctly, you didn't see a significant effect of um, age class in lactate, correct? But you did see based on the site, this is something. Yes. Did you look at any interaction terms? I did, but I'll see. Questions. Oh, sorry. Um, so Zach was asking if I saw any interactions <coughs> between site and capture method. And unfortunately, with our young of the year, we only ever captured them by the one capture method, um, except for the dip net and um, rod and reel. But our sample sizes would have been too small to really look at an interaction there. But that would be ideal if we were able to do that. Anybody else? You said the lactate really didn't really change much in the last three to six minutes. We do have blood draws to actually catch them. Wouldn't it be kind of a so, spoiler, um, <laughs> with all of our longline captured sawfish, we, we do do that. Um, I take a blood sample immediately, and I also take another blood sample before we release them. Um, I'm probably not even allowed to say that I've done that, <laughs> um, but the results are actually, um, there's not too much of an increase in lactate. Um, for most of them, and I actually have another figure. Uh, could you go to this one? Thank you, sir. Just to give you an idea, we caught a, a pregnant mother in Andros, and we actually had her restrained for quite a long time, and this red here is her beginning lactate. We sampled her really quickly, it was at about one, and then her release lactate was about 3.5. We had her for about an hour and a half because she pupped um, five pups. And the fact that her lactate only increased by 2.5 is pretty pretty good. It's still on the low end. Um, they are online. I don't know if they're on the NOAA website, but I know they're online. And there's a video of it on YouTube of the birth and everything. Didn't have time to show it today, but if you're interested, I can also send you the links. I have lots of videos. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bianca. We're just going to take a quick uh, two-minute break before the next presentation. So stay tuned. Okay, come on.